من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin, I would like to uh, just make a few short announcements. Uh, number one, as you all know, as was mentioned by our dear brother Mujtaba, that uh, most likely the beginning of the month of Ramadan uh, will begin, will be on Sunday. So, whether it is Saturday or Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, inshallah, we will begin our program on Sunday every night. As was mentioned before Maghrib, about an hour before Maghrib, uh, we will have the Quranic circle for those who would like to read the Quran, learn how to read, read with others, perfect your reading, memorize. This is a great opportunity because the month of Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن. The month of Ramadan is the one where the Qur'an was revealed and it was descended. Uh, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt and with your permission, I will be your servant for the next month. Uh, I am your brother, your son, your friend and most importantly your servant. Um, if you have any requirements, if you have any suggestions, if you have any criticisms, please feel free to approach me. Um, number two, we have the uh, timetable for the month of Ramadan, which as you can see has already been printed and prepared uh, with both calendars, the Gregorian calendar and the Islamic Hijri calendar uh, for every day of the month of Ramadan, including a list of the significant events the events which we will hold here in the month of Ramadan, all of the prayer timetables. And you can see all of the times of the prayer are here. And the time for iftar is in, is in bold letters because it's the most important one out of them all. So you can get a copy of this outside in the lobby. We usually send these in the mail, but uh, if you have not received one, uh, we recommend that you pick one up. And also take some for your friends and family members, a very useful uh, resource inshallah also brothers and sisters as you know this is your center it depends uh, on your donations and on your help whatever kind of support you can offer whether you can offer financial help whether you can offer your time uh, your manpower we need people who will help us in organization with iftar with keeping the program in check so we can offer you a quality program inshallah so any uh, any volunteers please approach um, our board members. Uh, if you have any uh, uh, financial commitments helping with the iftar, please uh, uh, approach uh, our dear brother, uh, Sayyid Miraf'ati, um, or any one of the board members, brother Samir Amiri, uh, if you, if you uh, know anyone uh, who would also like to donate and help, uh, please uh, let us know, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد الله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل على محمد وآل محمد Again, since we are standing at the doorsteps of the month of Ramadan, the month of mercy, forgiveness, and the month in which we honor the Quran, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tonight, 
I would like to give a brief introduction on some of the topics which will be discussed inshallah in this very blessed one uh, in this very blessed month beginning number one with the most important of all and that is the revelation of the Quran one of the first verses in the Quran if you were to read from the beginning one of the first verses to mention the month of Ramadan is Surah Al-Baqarah ayah number 185 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Shahru Ramadan the month of Ramadan and then immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins explaining the significance of the month of Ramadan الذي, that which unzila fihi al-Quran the Quran was revealed in it and then three attributes are mentioned number one hudan linnas a guidance for the people. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَى The most authoritative of all guidance. So number one, it is a guidance. Number two, it is the most authoritative of guidance. And number three, وَالْفُرْقَان And what is furqan? The word furqan refers to that which provides the ability to discern between right and wrong. So these are three attributes which are given to the Qur'an and this Qur'an is revealed in the month of Ramadan. Now, the Qur'an from before we are born until we are born and throughout our lives and when we are prepared for burial and even after our death, we hear the words of the Qur'an. It resonates in our ears, it resonates in our hearts and our minds. Before we are born, we hear the Qur'an being recited by our mothers, by our family members. When we are born, we hear the Qur'an is recited into our ears. The adhan is recited into our ears. And there's, there's a significance to this. There's a significance as to why it is recommended that uh, a mother who is uh, bearing a child recite the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wallahu akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'lamuna shay'a and Allah brought you out from the wombs of your mothers and you did not know anything wa ja'ala lakum as-sam'a wal-absara wal-af'ida la'allakum tashkurun and then he gave you three things he gave you the ability to hear as-sam' wal-absar the ability to see wal-af'idah the heart the ability to comprehend and understand now whenever sight and hearing is mentioned in the Quran except for one case hearing is always mentioned before sight why is this why is hearing mentioned before sight? They say that a child learns to hear or is given the ability to hear before he is given the ability to see. That's why if you notice a, a newborn, a child who is uh, one or two days old or three days old, if the child hears something that he does not like, a loud noise pop next to him, what happens? He reacts. Whereas if you wave your hand in front of him, for instance, he probably would not react. His sound is developed more than his eyesight. So Allah says that the child which is in its uh, mother's womb has the ability to hear before he has the ability to see. So as soon as we are born and from before we are born, we are blessed with the ability to hear. And that's why it's mustahab to recite Quran to a newborn child even before it is born, and then when it is born to recite the adhan and the iqama in each ear, so that that child, the sound of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resonate within his mind, within his hearing, and he will become used to it. He will be raised hearing the words of the Quran and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we spend an entire lifetime 
familiarizing ourselves with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are encouraged to read the Quran, we are encouraged to memorize the Quran. However, let's ask ourselves, is this it? That we only read the Quran and we memorize the Quran? Is that enough? When we speak about the Quran being number one, a guide, and not only a guide, the most authoritative of guides, and a criteria to discern between right and wrong. Now these are three very heavy attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the Quran. He says, with this, it is a guide, and it is the most authoritative of guide, meaning you will not need to seek out any other guide, and it is the criteria to discern between right and wrong. So if you have the Quran in your life, you will know the difference between right and wrong. I mean, these aren't attributes which are given to any book. They're not attributes which are given to any text. Now, let's talk more practical than theoretical, because some people say, I read the Quran. I've read the Quran 10 times front to cover. I've maybe memorized the Quran. However, these people are lost. In fact, and I'll mention in the coming nights, according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa He says that there will come a time where the only people who will be reciting the Quran on a daily basis if I remember correctly, the hadith says either one who is a deviant or a liar. Another hadith says that you will see a group of people who will recite the Quran and it will not go past their throats. Meaning what? It's just, it's just sounds which are being produced. So for people like that, it is not a guide and it is not the most authoritative of guides and it is not a criteria to discern between right and wrong. So what is... What are the conditions of the Qur'an? What are the conditions of the guidance of Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of these people. He says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, but their hearts do not understand. They have ears, but their ears cannot comprehend. <clears throat> and they have eyes, but their eyes cannot see. Now, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that these people are deaf, literally deaf, and dumb, and blind? No. Not in a literal sense, in a figurative sense. They see, but they do not see. They see, but they do not compre uh, comprehend. They do not recognize. Likewise, they hear, but they cannot understand. It goes in one ear, and it comes out the other. Or when they see, it doesn't reach their brain. It doesn't reach their heart. They don't know what to do with it. So, in order to benefit from the Qur'an, we ask ourselves, because God forbid that we are counted among those people, the ones who see and cannot hear, the ones who see and cannot understand, the ones who hear but cannot comprehend, and the ones whose hearts cannot understand the true guidance of the Qur'an. So, how do we prepare ourselves for the Qur'an? How do we begin to understand the Qur'an? What are the conditions of the guidance of the Qur'an? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the Qur'an belongs, the ability to understand the Qur'an belongs to a select few. And who are those? Who are the select few? In Surah Al-Imran, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He says, when speaking of the verses which have multiple meanings, He says, لَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And whom? الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Who are الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Who are الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ According to the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So you have the Qur'an and you have the Ahl al-Bayt. Now, the most famous hadith which brings together the Qur'an 
and the Ahlul Bayt speaks about the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt is which hadith? Hadith al Thaqalain. What is Hadith al Thaqalain? Hadith al Thaqalain, there are many versions of Hadith al Thaqalain. I will read to you one version. Hadith al Thaqalain is narrated, number one, many of the companions of Rasulullah and the companions which came after them, the companions of the companions, the Tabi'een, the members of Ahl al Bayt narrated this hadith, Hadith al Thaqalain. In it, and this is one version, the Prophet says, Inni tarikun fikum. I am leaving among you. Inni tarikun fikum. Ma in tamasaktum bihi lan tadallu ba'di. Kitab Allah, I am leaving two things. That if you hold steadfast to them, you shall not go astray. Number one is what? Kitab Allah, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, the Prophet here is reiterating the attributes, the guiding attribute of the Qur'an. Kitab Allah. Hablun mamdud min as samai ila al-arf. What does this, this, uh, this phrase mean? Hablun mamdud min as samai wal ard. A rope which hangs from the heavens to the earth. So our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Is the Qur'an. Wa itrati ahlu bayti. The second... The second part of the thaqalain is my atra, my family. Now we always hear hadith al thaqalain. It's something which, uh, which we're used to hearing. If you ask any uh, educated, conscious Muslim. Now some people differ. They'll tell you what the Prophet left behind was his Quran and his Sunnah. Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. However, the correct version is Kitab Allah wa Itrati. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my Itra, my family. Now what does he say after that? لَنْ يَفْتَرِقَ حَتَّى يَرِدَ عَلَيَّ الْحَوْضِ They will not separate until they rejoin with me. Where? On the pond. Al-Hawd refers to the pond. Now what pond is this? This pond uh, is the pond where the believers on the day of judgment shall meet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who wish to meet the Prophet on the day of judgment shall have the ability to do so. And the ahadith tell us that uh, those who meet him, those who have the honor of meeting him, he will be standing on a pond and he will uh, offer drinks to those who meet him. So he says, لَنْ يَفْتَرِقَ حَتَّى يَرِدَ عَلَيَّ الْحَوْضِ The Qur'an and this Ahl al-Bayt shall not separate until they return. So from now until we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and until we return to the Prophet, what do we have? We have the Quran and we have the Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet is saying that if you abandon the Ahlul Bayt السلام, then there is no use in the Quran. So when it comes to the guidance of the Quran, and it being the most authoritative of all guidance, and that it has the ability, or it is a criteria to discern between right and wrong, these three, act, these three attributes are only active when we take the Ahlul Bayt into consideration, when we enter the Ahlul Bayt into the equation. If you abandon the Ahlul Bayt السلام, then the Quran does not become a guide it does not become the most authoritative of all guidance and it does not become a criteria to discern between right and wrong. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going back, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Quran is شهر رمضان الذي أنزل, إليه, أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس when he says هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان all of this is conditional. It is conditional with the existence of Ahlul Bayt السلام, in the equation. Now look at other verses of the Quran. Other verses of the Quran also refer to the fact that on the day of judgment, <clears throat> just as the Prophet said, that they will come to me seeking the shafa'ah, seeking the blessings, and 
before they seek those blessings, in this life, they shall have to have held steadfast to the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. We say that the Qur'an itself refers to the Ahlul Bayt on more than one occasion. In one instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu, ittaqu allaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O those who believe, have piety from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. Be among those who tell the truth. Be among the truthful. Now whom are the truthful ones? Refer to another verse in the Quran. Min al mu'minina rijalun. What's the verse? Sadaqu ma'ahadu allaha alayhi. Fa minhum man qaba nahba wa minhum man yantadar. Who does this verse refer to? <clears throat> who are the ones who are truthful in their covenants with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who are they? According to, to the tafsir of Ahlul Bayt, whom are they? According to the hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, we are the ones who are referred to in this verse. Min al mu'minina rijalun sadaqu ma ahadu allaha alayhi. He says, me, me, and my uncle Hamza, and my brother Ja'far, and those who gave their lives in the path of Ahlul Bayt, from Ahlul Bayt in the path of Islam, they are the ones which are referred to in this verse. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On that day, we shall resurrect each person with their imam. So it's not only the, the Qur'an, there are people that are followed in this life that we shall be resurrected with. يَوْمَ نَدْعُ كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ Now look at the, last, the, the final part of this verse, the final part of this hadith. He says, فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ تُخَلِّفُونِي فِيهِمَا When the Prophet says that I have left behind two things for you, one is the Qur'an and the other is the Ahlul Bayt, he says, ask yourself, the Prophet says, he says, ask yourself, how will you take care of these things? How will you pay attention to these things? How will you handle these things after me? So what is the Prophet saying? Now, if the Prophet knew that there would be people who would not abandon the Qur'an and not abandon the Ahlul Bayt, there would, no, there would be no need for such insistence. There would no, be no need for the Prophet to say to us, ask yourself, ask yourself, how will you take care of these after me? Because we know according to the Qur'an and to the Ahlul Bayt, there are people that after hearing this hadith, and after understanding it, and after knowing whom it referred to, turned away. Some ahadith suggest the following, that on the day of judgment, there will be a group of people who will come to the Prophet while he is standing on the pond, and they will request his intercession, and the Prophet will want to intercede on their behalf but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept them. So the Prophet turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah tells him, He says that you do not know, you are, you are asking forgiveness for these people, but you do not know what they did after you, after you passed away. And for this the Qur'an says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدُ that this Prophet that is among you is none but a Prophet, is, is exactly like the Prophets which came before him. If he was to pass away or if he was to be murdered, the Quran says this, if he was to pass away, he could be assassinated. He could be martyred as well. In qalabtum ala aqabikum, will you turn away? So, number one, the Quran is suggesting that there will be people who will turn away. The hadith is also suggesting that there will be people who will turn away. And then 
the hadith also suggests that the Prophet left behind two things, the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. So what do we do? What is our responsibility towards the Qur'an? And what is our responsibility towards Ahlul Bayt? And how do we benefit from the guidance of the Qur'an? How do we understand that the Qur'an is the most authoritative of all guidance? And how do we understand that it is a criteria to discern between right and wrong? All these questions, inshallah, uh, we will seek to answer. However, I want to mention this. In order to ask these questions, in order to, uh, I'm sorry, answer these questions, we need to not only look at the Qur'an itself and the hadith, but we need to understand history. My personal humble opinion, and I am not an expert, I'm a student. However, what I have learned in the past few years is that without understanding uh, history, without studying history, um, there are many things which we will not understand. Number one, the Qur'an itself. The Qur'an is not a history book. However, much of its context in order for it to be understood and applied correctly, we must understand history. <clears throat> history tells us that there are those who stood fast to the Ahlul Bayt salam, and there are those who turned away from Ahlul Bayt salam, Ahlul Bayt including the Prophet himself. Those who benefited from the Qur'an, those who were able to manifest the verses of the Qur'an in early Islamic history are those who stood fast to both the Qur'an, held fast both to the Qur'an and to the Ahlul Bayt And those who abandoned the Qur'an are the ones who abandoned Ahlul Bayt And inshallah, in the, nights of, in the holy nights of Ramadan, we'll, we'll mention some of this. But history, why must we understand history? Not only does it allow us to understand the Qur'an, not only does it allow us to understand hadith, not only does it allow us to understand jurisprudence and theology, but history also allows us to understand our current state of affairs. If we understand our history, we can connect to our present, we can understand our present. Because as the saying goes, history repeats itself. Everything which has happened in today's world, although it might be um, a little different, however, in nature, it is similar. Everything which has happened today has happened many years ago. Everything which you see today on the news, when you turn on the news channels, on CNN, on BBC, all of these events, these horrible events or these lovely events, they've all happened in history before. Now, if we understand history, we can connect to our presence. And if we have understood our presence, we can then do what? We can prepare for our future. As the Prophet said, we have a responsibility. They will not separate the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt until they return. So from that day, from the day that the Prophet mentioned this hadith, until the day of judgment, there is a responsibility. How do we prepare for that responsibility? How do we prepare for that future? By understanding our present case. And how do we understand our present case? By understanding our history. Because by understanding our history, if we do not repeat the mis if, by, by, by uh, realizing the, the, the mistakes which took place in the past, we can fix those mistakes. We can have a better present for ourselves, and thus we can have a better future for ourselves. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In one verse, and I will end on this note, just to show the importance of Ahlul Bayt in context with the Qur'an and in context with Islam. The eighth Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salam, narrates from his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Qala Rasulullah, and by the way, our eighth Imam, Al Imam al Rada, one of his uh, books which he published during his lifetime, 
was referred to as Musnad al-Imam al-Rida. Now, why was this book important? And why were all the books of the eighth Imam important? Because if you study history, you would realize that before that time, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were not allowed to write. And Imam al kadhim the seventh Imam, was not allowed to write. He was in prison for most of his life. The sixth Imam had many students, but he himself was not allowed to write. Writing had become a privilege which belonged to only a few people. And inshallah, in the coming nights, I'll mention why writing was prohibited and why writing was banned. But not everybody was allowed to write. Those who were allowed to write needed special permission at the highest levels. The authorities, the highest levels, the Khalifa himself, the governor himself had to give you permission in order to write. Musnad al-Imam al-Rada is a compilation of a hadith of the eighth Imam which are narrated from his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So all of these ahadith he narrates, he says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who requested that he write this book? The Khalifa of the time, Al-Ma'moon al-Abbasi. Al-Ma'moon wanted to show the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi wa Now, for what reason and why he wanted to portray their knowledge? Uh, it was not out of love for the eighth Imam. He lived at a time where his, his throne his throne was very shaky. And so in order to consolidate his rule, he had to show that number one, he was a member of Ahl al-Bayt. He was the closest person to Ahl al-Bayt. And number two, if I'm a person of Ahl al-Bayt, look at the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt. We reserve the right to the throne through our knowledge and through our prestige and through our proximity to Rasulullah. So one of these books was referred to as Musnad al-Imam al-Rida. Now this book in itself Ex excerpts of it have been narrated in the book Uyun Akhbar al Rada. For those who want to understand and become acquainted with the words of our eighth Imam, this book is a treasure chest. Uyun Akhbar al Rada. It is a compilation of the most important sayings and the traditions and the sermons and the debates and the stories of our eighth Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn Musa al Rada. I will read to you. One of these ahadith, and let's reflect upon it. He says, "Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam, inna aliyan safinatu najatiha." The Prophet says of Imam Ali alaihi salam that he is the ark of salvation of what the ummah, the nation. Wa bab hittatiha. What is bab hitta? Does anyone know where, what Bab Hitta is? I'll give you a hint. It is mentioned in the Quran. Bab Hitta. The word Hitta is mentioned in the Quran. Any guesses? Bani Israel. Ahsan. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bab Hitta is a gate which is mentioned in the Quran in the story of Banu Israel. Now what is Bab Hitta? The word Hitta in the Arabic language means to expel or to put off. This was a gate which God commanded Bani Israel to enter in order to forgive their sins. And this gate marked the end of their journey. So when their journey began in the land of Egypt, when they were under the uh, Pharaoh of the time, when they were tortured, when they were imprisoned, when they were tormented, when they were subject to all kinds of psychological and uh, physical torment and torture, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to take them out of the land of Egypt they went to the desert and they were lost for 40 years. And their narrative is mentioned in the Quran. And uh, Banu Israel, out of all of the tribes and nations which are mentioned in the Quran, are the most to be mentioned in the Quran. The Prophet Musa is the most mentioned in the Quran. More, more mentioned than the Prophet Isa, more mentioned even than the Prophet Muhammad. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that I'll mention. Bab Hitta 
was, was basically the finish line for Banu Israel. So when they were taken out of Egypt and when they were wandering in the desert for generations and when they refused to enter Palestine but in the end they entered Palestine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders them to enter through this gate so that he can what? وَقُولُوا حِطَّةً he tells them, as you are entering, say hitta. Hitta means to put off, expel, meaning what? Oh Allah, expel our sins, expel our bad deeds, off put them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He wants to show us that Banu Israel, their finishing line was just to enter through this gate and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Meaning that all of the struggles that they went through from being tormented in Egypt to being expelled to crossing through the middle of an ocean through being lost for years through entering Palestine and having to fight all of that culminated in one small act and that was passing through a gate and asking for forgiveness so this represented uh, basically the, the climax of the mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had laid for Banu Israel. The Prophet in his hadith refers to Imam Ali alayhi salam as Bab Hitta. He is the gate. Meaning he, he is the finishing point. Meaning that Islam, the Quran, jurisprudence, theology, Everything, everything which, which has to do with Islam, everything which has to do with this way of life, everything which has to do with this path, this manhaj, all of this leads to one thing, and that is following in the path of Ahlul Bayt. So when the Prophet says that I have left behind two things, Kitab Allah, Wa Itrati, Ahlul Bayti, know that he is referring to the Quran, and his Ahlul Bayt refers to his direct Ahlul Bayt. And that is Imam Ali alayhi salam, Fatima al-Zahra, and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt which come after them. In another hadith, the Imam says, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, and this is narrated in a few books. One of the books which this is narrated in is the book of Salim ibn Qais al-Hilali. One of the most valuable books in the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt and one of the earliest written books in the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. The Prophet says in his hadith the following, that my nation, my nation, the Muslims who will come after me, will walk in the footsteps, the exact same footsteps of Banu Israel. This is what the Prophet says. That the exact same footsteps that, the, that, that Banu Israel will walk in, my nation will also walk in. So when he mentions Bab Hitta, he equates it with whom? Ahlul Bayt salam. As important as it was for the forgiveness, for the salvation of Banu Israel, that they walk through this gate and they ask for forgiveness, it is likewise just as important for the nation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to walk through the path and through the gate of Ahlul Bayt salam in order to attain success and salvation. So, having taken these things into consideration, inshallah, in the coming nights, we will try to familiarize ourselves more with the Quran and with the Ahlul Bayt. But more specifically, how do we fulfill our responsibility towards the Prophet? When the Prophet says, I am leaving behind two things, and they will not separate until the Day of Judgment. What does that mean when he says they will not separate until the Day of Judgment? Meaning that their authority, their influence, their binding ability will not be suspended until the Day of Judgment. Meaning that don't think that just after, that after I have passed away, that khalas, that's it. The Ahlul Bayt are irrelevant. They are relevant during the life of the Prophet, but after the life of the Prophet, they are irrelevant. Or the Quran is relevant as long as it is being revealed to the Prophet and that's it. No, it is relevant until they return to me on the Day of Judgment. 
So we have a responsibility. How do we fulfill this responsibility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How do we fulfill this responsibility towards the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt in light of history and in light of tradition? Inshallah, in, in some of the nights, I would like to shed light on some of the companions of Ahlul Bayt alayhi One time I was asked, um, well, how, how do we become like Ahlul Bayt? And uh, to a person who would ask, how do we become like the Ahlul Bayt? Because we always, we always preach that the Ahlul Bayt are the perfect role models. I think before answering that question, we should ask ourselves, how do we become like the companions of Ahlul Bayt? Because the Ahlul Bayt are out of our reach. But the companions of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, those who associated themselves, those who lived with the Ahlul Bayt, those who walked with them, those who learned from them, those who uh, spent their entire lives in their service and their dedication. You know, uh, w once you begin to familiarize with these people, uh, some of them were, were truly legends. We should aspire to be like the companions of Ahlul Bayt, people like Salman al-Muhammadi, people like Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Kumail ibn Ziyad, Malik al-Ashtar. Inshallah, by understanding them, uh, by familiarizing ourselves with their seerah, we will be able to familiarize ourselves with the Ahlul Bayt السلام, themselves. And from there, we will be able to uh, attain righteousness and guidance as the Quran uh, was sent to us as a guide, an authoritative guide, and the criteria to discern between what is right and what is wrong. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from the Quran in the holy month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from the blessings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam in the holy month of Ramadan. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all of our sins and all of our shortcomings and all of our evil deeds in this holy month. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <coughs> اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين